Uh, Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a a Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian. I never thought... He never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hard-working Macedonian peasants, and the way they were able to reach out yeah. and uh, steal um, the election. But yeah, so Alexander Soros is in, uh, in uh, Okrid, I see, right? Yep. Okay. He's, With uh, his retinue? Yes, he's, uh, he's just, I mean... I don't think he's ever. I'll bet he's never changed a tire. I'll bet he doesn't even know how to drive a stick shift. He just, he just <laughs> looks. He literally looks like this mousy, wimpy, the pajama boy. Yeah, beta cuck. Yes, he's just, as they call them on Twitter now, a okay. soy boy. <laughs> soy boy. Yeah, he's just a disgusting. I mean, first of all, and you know, I don't want to do ad hominem attacks. Yes, I do. Uh, but his ideology, of course, is all wrong. They did nothing but ad hominem at us. I mean, it was yeah. ad hominem after ad hominem. Yeah. Nothing but his uh, his ideology is all Moral wrong. It's most most Macedonians would not accept his uh, ideology and that of his father. But uh, anyway, let's uh, let's do a podcast here. Yep, number forty-eight. Forty-eight, yeah. By now, okay. Yeah, it's time flies. It does. All right, you ready? Up, uh, sure. Tres, dos, uno. For the professional elite, including the academics, media, think tanks, civil society, and certainly the unelected bureaucrats, it was bad enough when French President Emmanuel Macron said non to Macedonia beginning a session talks with the European Union last month. But now he has committed the unforgivable sin, stating, quote, what we are currently experiencing is the brain death of NATO, unquote. And not just that, but on Russia, he said, quote, we need to reopen a strategic dialogue, unquote, with Russia. All of this gave the aforementioned professional elite the vapors. They threw a collective hissy fit, got their knickers in a knot, beat their chests and braided the moon, and of course, shed many liberal tears. So-called expert Florian Bieber, always one who wants to see his name in ink, tweeted that Macron's views on the Balkan are, quote, based on ignorance, bias, and arrogance, unquote. And while the learned professor probably knows more about the Balkans than Le Président de France, Bieber is perhaps one of the most arrogant and biased, quote, experts, unquote, on the Balkans alive today. All of this has implications for Macedonia, of course, and in the meantime, Don Zaev de la Mertino is facing growing problems in Macedonia. And yet Zaev keeps insisting that, quote, there is no alternative, unquote. But the wise and prudent leader would be planning for other alternatives just in case. But Zaev is neither wise, nor prudent, nor a leader. We'll discuss all of this and more on this episode of the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. I'm Jason Miko, coming to you from the foot of the Catalina Mountains in Oro Valley, Arizona. And this is Tvetan Shulimanov calling in from Skopje, uh, Republic Macedoine du Nord. Have you did some French in school? No, no, I did the Spanish. Uh, ah, well. Yo tengo dos, an, yo tengo dos años uh, in secondario escuela. Yo escribo, yo comprendo, yo... Uh, Yo, uh, 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 ah, bloody hell, I've already forgotten it. So, yes, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Mrs. Pierce was my Spanish teacher. I still, that's one of the only teachers' names I remember. So, uh, anyway, yep. yes, um, Senora Pierce. <laughs> yes, so, um, this you know, we, we start here with this bigger picture of uh, everybody is, is freaking out over uh, mm. Emmanuel Macron, and just uh, two years ago, they were all praising him. When he uh, when he was condemning quote unquote nationalism and saying you know praising patriotism and everything everything else and uh, he was their hero and now he is the villain and it's amazing how quickly these uh, unelected uh, elite uh, professional self appointed elite turn on him uh, and everybody else now all of this of course has uh, implications for Macedonia so. Um, Zayev has put his entire political capital on the line with the uh, EU membership, and of course mm-hmm. that has failed. But beyond that, um, Zayev, uh, I mean, 
uh, let's be honest, he's just got some really bad luck as well, to be honest. Uh, but a lot of this is his own making. So we've got the ongoing scandals. We've got these smears that uh, Citizen is directing against uh, the opposition, against Lumbro of the Pamene. Uh We have uh, the, the new one this week, the uh, chemical spill with the uh, Ojis there in Skopje. Mm. Um, what else? Is going on that uh, that Zayev is is facing uh, and uh, and doing a terrible job of uh, responding to. Hey, just millions of little things which are just uh, quality of life issues, such mm. as you know dogs in the streets. And uh, I was exercising yesterday by the window, and I started hearing something like firecrackers. And I kind of think, should I step away from the window <laughs> in case these are not firecrackers? Nah, relax. It's probably. Fu- just, you know, some idiots uh, using up their last year's stash. And then this the morning I, I read the, in, the, in the news sites that it was actually a, a robbery in which the attackers, uh, a, a guy who was cleaning the street, you know, like uh, an employee of the city was like um, sweeping the street. Street and, sweeper, uh, yeah. He sees them breaking into a, a store, tries to scare them off, mm-hmm. and they shoot him in the leg, and they also fire like 20 shots, 15 shots, I'm not sure how many were there, but it was a lot. It was a, a proper barrage and, and fled. And, you know, this is, these are the kind of things that happen every day by now. And it's really, and this is, this the pollution is going to start. Well, yeah, there's the pollution. Yeah, yeah, but, but, ugly. yeah but the, the, this random shooting that you just mentioned and, and the, uh, the, the, the bank robberies, the, 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 the shootings, um, just general crime in general has, has really gone up over the past couple of years, I think. Or at least it's certainly being reported on more. Uh, I just don't remember that when I lived there. Um, yeah, it's just going downhill. I mean, it's yeah. seriously going downhill. Yeah. Uh, and now we... Uh, especially because, you know, they're not going to get arrested the way things are going. Yeah. I mean, they, they catch them, they release them. Catch and release. Um, well, that's because <laughs> that's because Zayev and, and his, uh, his government are putting everything they've got into still, still convincing President Emmanuel Macron that Macedonia is ready and uh, that Macron should change his mind. I mean, think about, think about the arrogance of that. I saw, I saw something that Zayev mm-hmm. said the other day that he was, gonna, he was going to uh, convince Macron that Macedonia is ready and he's going to convince Macron to change his mind. I mean, just think for a moment about the, both the ignorance and the arrogance of that statement. Emmanuel Macron is going to receive this little man from Macedonia and listen to him and then say snap his fingers, and then say, yeah. you know what? I was wrong. You're right. How could I have done this? And admit that to the world? I mean, it's, it, it's just it's ludicrous. And, and so it's it's both ignorant and arrogant of Zayev to even think this. So, Well, Macron is not even inviting Zayev over. He's going to have Pendarovsky. While uh, Vucic today lorded of the, over Zayev, they, they were both like uh, two heads higher than, than Zayev, both Vucic and Rama, and it really looked like Everybody was joking like this is two and a half men <laughs> episode. And uh, Vucic said, well, I'm going to Paris tomorrow. I had Macron like recently in Belgrade. I'm going to ask about you two losers uh, in the meantime. <laughs> well, after I, I sort things with him about Serbia, making sure that we uh, continue to progress toward the European Union. Well, the two of you are uh, left behind. Right. Uh, Macron did say in the economist interview that he is open to changing his mind mm. he practically because the dutch were blocking albania mm-hmm. so uh macron wants to be like a good guy toward macedonia he doesn't want to block both countries he says well i was gonna let macedonia through but then that meant decoupling it from albania uh and uh, i didn't want to do this and eventually it was the netherlands who blocked macedonia by default because both me and the netherlands were blocking Albania, but the the reason why he said that uh, uh, he wanted to block, uh, to, not to decouple Macedonia from Albania, is that he said the Albanians will get restless. Ah, yes. This is very, very <laughs> ugly. Yeah, he also said, um, he, he, he claimed that the uh, Bosnia Herzegovina was a ticking time bomb, I think, as well. Uh, so, uh, and which again gave the aforementioned uh, professional uh, self appointed elite another mm. chance to beat their beat their chests and bray at the moon. And uh, uh, going back to, you mentioned uh, Serbian President Alexander Vucic, um, who I I saw an article who said he's not going to go on repeating, quote, like a parrot, unquote, 
that there is no other alternative. So, which is something that you know, listeners of this uh, podcast and readers of my column uh, know for, the, for a long time I've been uh, just uh, harping on. <laughs> I've been repeating like a parrot the fact that, that Zayev is repeating yeah. like a parrot that there is no alternative, which, of course, is designed to just shut down debate, uh, dismiss your opposition. Uh, and you know what? It's inherently lazy. Okay, mm. so we, we have a set of facts here that Macedonia is not getting a date to open a session talks. So why don't you explore other opportunities and other things? I mean, well, you mentioned this, uh, the, the mini Shingen thing, which is uh, kind of a, a consolation prize or something like that. But it's not just that. There's other things that, that are being talked about that are, that are alternatives. Uh, maybe it's not to totally replace the idea of European Union membership, but it's things that work that the country can be uh, aspiring to and working on that would be good for the citizens of not just Macedonia, but the region. So there are alternatives. Um, anyway. Yeah, uh, Vucic told this to Zayev, uh, just as Zayev was repeating as a parrot that there is no alternative. <laughs> we got ahead. So it was really, I mean, it was really humiliating for, for uh, old Zoki here. But, uh, uh, you know, it's a very nice term. It used to mean something completely different, yeah. that there is no alternative to free markets. Sure. Uh, which Maggie Thatcher used to repeat she did. Uh, yes. labor in the United Kingdom, and she was correct. And you know, to pervert this saying now in this way, it's, it's really despicable. Just as uh, you know, the, the left is perverting the word liberal, yes. uh, another uh, value, you know, laudable uh, terms. And uh, but uh, the, the problem is that uh, you know uh, we could all get behind, and this was. Actually, our plan and under Gruevsky, when we realized we were blocked by the EU, mm -hmm. that we find an alternative, which was very much along the lines of what Maggie Thatcher would say, uh, would propose, or what the United Kingdom is now preparing for, is they're leaving the EU, which meant lower taxes, lower regulation, uh, making the best possible use of the uh, our access to the European market, which we already have, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, filling in, finding a niche which is a pretty big niche, actually, car manufacturing mm -hmm. in Macedonia. And then, you know, as our workforce graduates towards software and finance and the, the you know, the nicer stuff. But, uh, and, you know, if you could build like a mini Schengen on the basis of this, low taxes, low regulation, uh, low, uh, you know, uh, relaxed labor rules and uh, uh, manufacturing, it would be great, but we're obviously going to build it especially in the Edirama dominated section of mini Schengen. We're going to fill it with cannabis production and migrant smuggling toward Europe. This is, this is, these are the businesses that are going to develop under Zayev, which Zayev himself is actually investing in, in drug producing. And, um, and his family, it should be yeah, pointed gonna, out. Not just, not just Zayev himself, but Zayev's family. It's a, criminal, it's a family criminal enterprise. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, uh, the benefits of a mini Schengen are minuscule because we already have very open borders. We can travel easily, no passports, no no visas. We're now making a big deal out of like reducing waiting lines at the border crossing for by five minutes, which is you know not not that a big deal. We're gonna make it easier for trucks to go through, but you know, even now it's not that much of a hindrance. Uh, work uh, permits between the mini Schengen countries are gonna be made m e easier to obtain. Again, it's, we already have this. Right. It's not going to generate that much new uh, economic uh, growth in, uh, in the region, but, but it's going to restrict us from one alternative, which Bulgaria was pushing, that we are fast-tracked to the EU under their tutorage and patronage. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not going to happen. This is why uh, you know, Boyko Borisov was so angry at the Brussels summit. This is not going to happen. And now we're falling in between Serbia and Albania dominated uh, portions of uh, mini Schengen ghetto, but as Serbia and Montenegro have a chance to advance to the EU, we're going to be left stuck with the with the Muslim majority part of the Balkans, with the Albanians and the Kosovars and, and the Bosnians. This is going to be, a, you know, such a disaster. I don't have words. Well, yeah, but but you just you just mentioned there in your mini rant, um, you know, the alternatives uh, to pursuing EU membership or even perhaps parallel with pursuing EU membership. You mentioned the low taxation, the attract, attracting uh, FDI, you mentioned auto manufacturing, uh, things that the uh, former government was doing uh, before uh, Zayev was installed. 
And and it just seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm open to correction, I'm a conservative, that's what we're about, we're always open to correction. Um, but it just seems to me, Svetin, that Zayev has is, is put all of his chips, to, to use a, a poker term, on EU membership, not even pursuing FDI and, and, and uh, foreign... Foreign direct, with FDI foreign direct investment mm-hmm. coming into Macedonia, and, and it just you know he he mentioned it early in his when he was when he was uh, when he took over the government, but it's all dropped by the wayside. And and again, as I said, you know this there is no alternative thing. It's just a lazy attitude. We're just going to we're we're going to convince Macron that to open up EU accession talks. Then EU accession talks are going to be opened, and then magically everything will be right, and mm-hmm. the money will just pour in. Um, the unicorn, the unicorns will fly. Uh, pigs will, uh, pigs and unicorns will fly, and and everything's just going to be peach king. And just, none of that's true. It's, it's, it just, it's frustrating uh, yeah. to see him do this. But um, anyway, uh, let's let's kind of move on to some of these things we were talking about. Tell me about the because um, I saw one or two articles. Uh, Going, coming, bringing us all back to Macedonia and what's going on, what he's faced, Zayev is faced with, other than dealing with uh, the French president. Uh, the Ohis uh, spill, um, mm. which we talked about earlier. So Ohis is, a, is an old communist era f- uh, chemicals factory on kind of the edge of Skopje beyond Kislavoda. Um, but it's been closed for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah, it went bankrupt. They couldn't keep up with the market forces, the management kept plundering the factory like uh, the communist era management did in all other similar factories. Mm-hmm. They wanted to buy it for themselves, mm-hmm. but they didn't have the capital or the technology to the, turn it around or make it worthwhile under an open market uh, system, and uh, it just went bankrupt. The manager was arrested after a while. But, oh, I remember uh, that. What was his name? How good is it? Uh, uh, Yorgo Chuka. Mm. Yes, I do remember yeah, And him. thousands yeah. of people were fired, yeah. and uh, they still protest sometimes, demanding some back pay. I think some are still receiving some kind of government assistance, but it's like many other similar industrial plants around Skopje. And it's not that far from the center anymore, because the city grew, and especially this part of aerodrome close to it uh, grew exponentially. And this is like very close to the the large Jevair buildings, uh, which are, you know, uh, 40 stories, four 40 stories oh, buildings. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, it's near, I've got friends in Pintia. That's right near Pintia, I believe. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So there was a chemical spill. Uh, people naturally, justifiably worried about that. The government says, nah, nothing to see here, move along. Um, mm. have, they, uh, have they got it cleaned up? Yeah, these are like large rusting uh, tanks which hold the uh, chemicals, which Ohis used to produce detergents and acrylic fibers and other stuff they would produce there uh, at, back in the day and uh, as the company stopped operating but it had uh, uh, reserves of chemicals for, for a while to carry it further and these were left and the tanks are rusting and it's seeping into the ground there is some chemical called lindan which has apparently penetrated deep into the ground and it would take like forever to remove the, the soil and then maybe there were some plans to plant something on top of this, that would make it like some plants which clean up the the, the ground. Uh, some are proposing uh, turning it to, into a cemetery. <laughs> Others would say like uh. Uh, the only uh, way to turn it around financially would be to give somebody to build, uh, you know, proper real estate there, like uh, residential buildings, and and people would lap it up. I mean, trust me, you, you know, Linden Chemicals be damned, you know. B- only, only companies which would have the funding to remove the tanks, uh, maybe just do some, you know, uh, surface level cleanup and uh, of the soil and say, okay, we fixed it, uh, and then build. On top of it would be the construction companies. This is like right. quite a big property in a desirable part of the city, but uh, nothing has been done and just some small scale siphoning off of the chemicals. And apparently, this was meant for Switzerland. I don't know what they're doing with this probably chemical, you know, a poison gas <laughs> mm. <laughs> or something. This is so old chemical, it's, it's, I, I don't think it's usable anymore for whatever its purpose was back in the day. Some, something called metal uh, acylate or, or something mm. like acry- acrylate or something. Yeah. And I suppose it was used to make fibers. Yeah. I don't know if it's more poisonous 
with the passage of time or less poisonous, <laughs> but it smells horribly. Uh -huh. It is toxic. Yep. Uh, and, you know, people were freaked out. Wow. Well, so you've, you've got that. People, again, are, are justifi justifiably worried, and their safety should come first. It should be the first priority of the government, both the city uh, government as well as uh, the national government. Um, let's uh, let's switch tack slightly to over, over to the, uh, the special prosecutor. Um, mm -hmm. So what's going on? So I understand that the... Uh, uh, the uh, former special prosecutor's office can't pay their electric bill. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, the wow. poor, the poor darlings. Uh, and Zaf is the, the letters Katisianova sent from prison, where she's supposed to be stripped of all her authority mm -hmm. uh, on the count of being detained for abusing her office uh, financially and politically. Uh, well, she sent letters giving her cases to the uh, OYA service of prosecutors, the much larger office where her SPO office was uh, ex extracted from, but uh, so everybody on the government side insists that these letters are legitimate because this allows Zayev to continue arresting Vimera people uh, and prosecuting them, uh, you know, Gruevsky and he, the people around him based on the charges Katit Sayaneva initiated, which are now managed by the OI office, mm -hmm. which is again very loyal to Zayev, but uh, other documents which other orders which uh, she might give or you know a, a deputy appointed by default or anything everybody says none of this uh, is applicable only the this order which we really want which is to continue trying the, uh, the cases and uh, all other day-to-day -day orders like paying the salaries paying the bills etc this is uh, uh, this is considered not valid and yeah, they're, they're now, you know, these people who were extorting millions from businessmen, they would charge and who would flash around with Louis Vuitton bags mm -hmm. and who would be seen buying real estate across the country, etc. They're now complaining that the poor darlings, they don't have money. There was some stupidly emotional comment today well, I, uh, by an anonymous prosecutor. Well, I signed up here for justice and the rule of law and I'm going to stay working for the special prosecutor's office even if I'm the last person in the office and the lights is shut and there is no heating, I'm going to keep coming for no salary. Like, yeah, right. Get out of here. I mean, this is so pathetic. <laughs> Such losers. <laughs> How do you really feel? Um, okay, so, <laughs> so but, but where are we now with the... the, the are, they're going to go to trial now, right? Uh, the Katica and Boki and um, uh, Zoran Mileski are going to be put on trial? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, there, there's a procedure where the court needs to accept whether the charges are worthy, you know, mm -hmm. good enough to proceed to a full trial. This stage passed. Obviously, Katica, her lawyers, Irina Frchkovska, the wife of this oh, yes. despicable former interior minister, uh, they who was king during this time when uh, all of these companies like Ohis were being destroyed and, you know, the police, the prosecutors were supposed to investigate the plundering of the communist era companies mm -hmm. and they did nothing. They would just divide the spoils all related. between the government ministers. All related. And now his wife, his latest wife, is uh, <laughs> defending Katicianova. And they, they filed, you know, they obviously demanded that the charges are dropped, but the court decided that we're going ahead. And now they're supposed to assign a judge to Katicianova electronically, which is the usually abused way of, uh, you know, it's supposed to be like random number generator, yeah. but it always happens to be like, all the cases against Vimera were assigned to Dobrila Katsarska, the judge, who could be counted on to give the most strict verdict and whatever Zaev wants at the time, Zaev will get. Right. So so now we're waiting to have a judge appointed to okay. uh, Katsarska's case. Okay, and, and I assume also for Boki 13 and uh, Mileski as well. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so yeah. let's just, regardless of who the judge is, you say you've got that, then you actually have to go to trial. And how long could a trial take? I mean, this thing... My point being that this thing is going to be dragged out uh, into next year during the elections or as we're getting close to the elections. And that just doesn't, yeah. to me, it doesn't seem like that's something that uh, Zayev wants, uh, you know, out in the press every day and the public thinking about as they sit down at their, uh, to, to, uh, to read the morning newspaper or listen to the news and have their coffee, to have this constantly in their face that, that the crown jewel of Zayev and his government and the Western progressive elites that put him in power, the crown jewel on trial. 
Hmm. During an election campaign. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like they would want that. Yeah, Zayev is in a pickle. He would like to postpone this for after the elections. But Katis Yanev, who is cooperating now with Zayev, giving these orders to give the cases to uh, the oil prosecutors, uh, she's obviously coordinating with Zayev. Mm-hmm. And uh, she would like this wrapped up as soon as possible before the government is replaced. Uh, but I, I don't know if she has much to haggle with, except, you know, just going full you know, giving like a full testimony what Zayev knew and when he knew it, uh, which would be very dangerous for her, her family, etc. But this is the only thing she can haggle with, she can bargain with. She would like this wrapped up as soon as possible with this level of charges not expanded, not broadened into other people. There is a separate case which involves Frosina Reminsky, a top SDSM official, but uh, this is for a different uh, line of racketeering which Boki 13 was engaged with. So this could be postponed, while Katica's case, uh, yeah, it's uh, very likely that she will want this done as soon as possible and, uh, you know, just get like a few years and then maybe quickly commute it into uh, a suspended sentence. Well, yeah, you're right, Zaf would definitely want to have this postponed. Right. And then you've got Racket 2. Uh, and I see that uh, the journalist uh, Branko Gerowski uh, published a or announced or made or published some more details. This is the the, rac- the racket, uh, the the uh, the scandal, I should say, involving um, the uh, health insurance fund director Dan Donchev and uh, the, the mm-hmm. health minister Venko Filipce, the Swedish uh, firm and the Macedonian um, dialysis firm Diadem, I believe is the name of it. Uh, yep. And so that is still ongoing as well. Uh, and what is the what is the latest on that in terms of legal issues? Uh, this is a private charge from the owner of Diadem, who is accusing uh, uh, Donchev and Filip of extorting money from her. Uh, and, you know, this clearly goes to Zaf as well, just like the other uh, Katicianov racket case. And uh, uh, the court is still, has still not decided, or actually the prosecutors at this point need to decide whether they're going to uh, accept the privately filed charges okay. from... Uh, but... Uh, they still haven't decided, but then obviously Vomero is in, in, implying, is hinting that they have evidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laris Geyser is hinting that he has evidence, yes. apparently recordings, which will surface if the prosecutors don't do their thing and don't uh, pick up the case. And this is obviously, the timing of this completely depends on the opposition and on Geyser and obviously the Diadem people who were apparently very likely recording these extortion attempts and uh, are probably sharing this with uh, Geyser or other people. And if, uh, you know, there's many ways to make the material public Mm -hmm. and this would be up to them to choose the timing and uh, hopefully they (laughs) they choose wisely and time it well before the election. Right, yeah, well, so it's it's still another one of these things that's hanging over Zayev's head and hanging over his government's head. Uh, and uh, it doesn't sound like it is going anywhere fast. No, no. And Katicianev is negotiating, apparently, with people. There was a picture circulating of her speaking on uh, Viber or, you know, yeah. this camera with somebody, whether from prison, where she has, apparently, uh, computer privileges. or. But, yeah, she is, she is working her angles, and uh, she, she's trying to... <laughs> to Cut deals. I mean, if she was smart, if Boki was smart, they would try to make deals with the incoming government, not with Zaev. But uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Well, well. Speaking of the incoming government, assuming it is not going to be Citizen M, um, again, we have elections coming up in April, April twelfth. Uh, per uh, the uh, Prigino agreement, um, Zaev has to step down. I guess January third. New prime minister from Citizen M. Vumaro Dopamene gets a couple of uh, positions, including interior minister and uh, I think uh, uh, health and welfare or something like that. Uh, labor and labor welfare. welfare. Okay, yeah. And then, so anyway, so he, here we are. We're coming up uh, this middle of November next week. Oh, I should say we are recording this. Uh, this is episode number 48. We're recording this on uh, Sunday, November 10. This will drop tomorrow, Monday, November 11, just to uh, kind of... Uh, Put a date stamp on this so folks know what we're talking about, where we're going. Anyway, with with you know a month from now, you know both uh, on both sides of the pond, 
uh, y'all are going to be thinking of Christmas and New Year's, and we're going to be thinking of Christmas and New Year's, and then all of a sudden January comes. January 3rd, as I just mentioned, this, this change in government. Orthodox Christmas is January 7th. Uh, they got old New Year's, etc. So there's there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people aren't going to be really focused on the politics and whatnot. They are rightly going to be celebrating the holidays with the families and friends. Um, and then in in the meantime, while all this is going on, now there's talk about a new electoral model that Zayev seems to be mm -hmm. gung ho moving towards making Macedonia one electoral unit. Uh, his partners in crime, uh, sorry, his partners in government, uh, Dewey. Um, are against that. Uh, what what can you tell our uh, our listeners about that? Well, first of all, there is a lot of chatter from Zayev people, Spasovsky most recently, that they want to escape from the elections using this uh, com uh, this uh, necessity to ratify the NATO protocol. Oh yes, exactly. as soon as it's ratified by Spain, so they're still talking about this, and it might happen. So th this is one of their exit strategies: try to postpone the elections until October. And hope that you know Macron, you know, muddles something up by then, and that people forget about the crime and racketeering. Uh, and if not, their other option is to amend the electoral laws, which has never, which is never done without the approval of all major parties. Uh, you know, amending the model, the way which members of parliament are elected, it was always agreed consensually, and if everybody can't agree, you know, every big party can't agree. You just don't do it. But now Zaev is uh, saying that he's going to do this unilaterally, which is a huge break of uh, trust and uh, uh, precedent. Uh, this would mean um, we currently have six districts. Each of them uh, elects 20 members of parliament uh, through a proportionate model, which means that the small parties, if you have a geographically concentrated small party, you do fine. And Albanian parties do fine because they're concentrated in one district and then in several others, they can count on a few members of parliament extra. But then, I don't know, the Serbian party or the Bosniak party can't win one member. Uh, so they have to go with either Vemera or SDSM in coalition to make their votes count. If we have one uh, unit, basically if you win a bunch of votes all across the country, you have a chance of winning one member of parliament. This would apply to renegade uh, these fake Vemera parties which Zaev is supporting, mm. like Ljubčos or Ljubes or Stojan Changelov's party. Uh, this would uh, do well for Levitsa, the far-left group, which could not win a seat on its own, but might win uh, one or two if uh, we have a large uh, uh, one uh, electoral district. And, you know, Vemero is the SM and the Albanian parties, and Dui would lose one or two seats in parliament, but then we would get a few smaller parties in, and this would mean that uh, you know Zaev is counting that he can use the prosecutors, the police, the budget, the instruments of power to keep these smaller parties in check, that they would join a coalition with him, and uh, meanwhile he would deprive Vemera of several seats in parliament, while uh, he would lose several himself, mm -hmm. but then he would... Uh, hold on to, I don't know, the Roma party, Amdi Bayram, or the Serbian party, you know, these these guys who usually flip sides when the government changes. Sure. Uh, he would he hopes that he would be able to hold on to them after the election. Now, the important question is, what does it take to change the electoral model in terms of uh, legislation? Is it just a simple uh, majority vote, or is it a two-thirds vote, or what? Yeah, it's 61 votes. I think the Albanian, a majority of Albanians is necessary too. Right. But, you know, it's never been done in this way before. It's, uh, you know, it's another sign that Zaf is going to play dirty uh, if, if we needed any more convincing and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, anything else to tell us that. Yeah. You mentioned um, uh, at the beginning of that uh, the issue of Zaev trying to perhaps postpone elections because Parliament needs to be seated uh, when the um, the NATO uh, ratification comes up, uh, be mm. and we're still waiting for Spain. I should also mention that today, again, Sunday, November 10, so the Spanish are having elections today. So the reason that they have not ratified the uh, the NATO um, uh, accords for uh, for Macedonia is because they haven't had a government. Uh, I'm looking at a BBC. Mm. Look, you you think you got a bad in Macedonia? I'm looking at a BBC article right here. It says, "quote Spain has not had a stable government since 2015." 
<laughs> so they're having well same same yeah here. exactly yeah well you know well actually i mean if, frankly uh look at israel israel looks like they're gonna have to have a third election and within this within mm. the year uh coming up soon as well but anyway so the spanish are having elections today then they've got to form the government and that's a bit messy and whatnot once they finally form the government, then they would vote whatever their procedure is internally uh, to accept Macedonia as a NATO member. None of that's going to happen before, I think it's December 4, is that when the uh, the NATO meeting in London is? Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, see, NATO London. something like yeah. that. Yeah, so, uh, but anyway, so Macedonia is not going to be a, um, Macedonia is not going to be an official um, member of NATO by uh, December 4, it's going to be next year sometime. Um, let's see, yes, December 3 and 4. So uh, celebrating NATO's 70th anniversary. I'm going off on a quick tangent here, but I've got this I've got this number of 70 stuck in my head for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. The Soviet Union didn't quite make it to 70 years. It fell apart at 69. But the People's Republic of China just celebrated 70 years. NATO is celebrating mm -hmm. 70 years. The European Union, depending on when you... Um, when you count its formation, whether it's the uh, uh, the, Par the Treaty of Paris, Treaty of Rome, uh, the Schumann, um, I forgot the word, uh, Schumann, mm -hmm. anyway, um, it's, it's coming up on 70 years, and there's a, something about 70 that uh, could be good or bad for you. Anyway. Um, well, Nito, go Nito has gone brain dead by, by <laughs> if you trust Macron. Yes, yes, going back to what Macron said earlier, brain dead. Um, did he actually say brain dead or brain? What, did he, what was his quote? Let me go back and look at this. Uh, the brain death of NATO. That's what he said. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. Brain dead is an excellent sitcom uh, on Amazon Prime, but mm -hmm. uh, involving uh, Washington D.C. Yep. politics. Seven oh, excellent. Okay. All right. Anyway, so that's the uh, the elections coming up. Um, obviously, we will be treated to um, to nonstop news about those elections and the back and forth and what's going on. Um, what else we got? Uh, well, uh, on the elections, I mean, we, we still have a functional parliament uh, well into February, so right. you know there is plenty of time for the Spanish to ratify this and the few remaining holdouts. Uh, but yeah, it, Zayef is obviously mentioning this to postpone the elections. Uh, what else have we got? We have, uh, we have. I mean, there are shoes dropping on the colored revolution every day, like one worse than the other. <laughs> The latest was that uh, I'm not sure if we discussed this here. This uh, the policeman who killed Martin Nishkovsky, this huge case right. in 2011, yeah. a brutal police uh, officer beating to death a 20-year-old mm. kid during a celebration of uh, you know Vimera, uh election victory. In uh, but he was you know he was a Vimera supporter. He was you know probably too eager to get closer. And then the policeman kills him, beats him to death, and people were horrified yeah. uh, who, who saw this and. Uh, um, the policeman then tried to escape, uh, you know, to avoid blame by not reporting this, playing dumb. Uh, and there were some people coming into town. There was, I think we were playing Scotland and uh, there was uh, some carnival, you know, the Basker Fest uh, oh, yeah. organized by the guys from this, yeah, from the winery. So there was a whole bunch of strangers in town. The murder was not reported. The family did not report the murder. So the police was not sure they have a body, but they, they're not sure who to trust. Uh, and uh, only it takes a few days to identify the child and the, the kid. And the, um, then the policeman is pressured and he acknowledges what happened. Uh, ASDSM starts protesting this. And then in 2015, four years later, they start, they use this in the colored revolution because they edit a wiretap, edit out the parts in which it's clear that Gruevsky the interior minister, Gordon and Kulovsk at the time, are concerned about the murder and are making sure that the policeman, Igor Spasov, is not allowed to escape, to, to cover up the case, but that, in fact, he would be tried in full. Mm -hmm. This is very clear from the full recording, a uh, 12 minutes uh, tape, which was aired in full only this year, only recently, months ago. But Zayev edited a few portions of the tape and they made them look like Gruevsky and Yankulovsky are trying to cover up the murder. They would paint the Skopje town square where the celebration took place and the murder was uh, carried out in, in red, in blood. Mm -hmm. They would go after government officials shouting at them, killers, murderers. This was the most violent protest where they would pelt the police with stones and try to break into the government building. 
Uh, and um, and now the, the policeman, in the meantime, hired a lawyer who also defended Zoran Zaev, uh, and who now works with Zaev in his marijuana business. And then uh, Zaev meets him in prison during a visit to Idrizova, because the policeman was sentenced under Vemera to 14 years in prison. It was not, you know, it was the, the probably the highest penalty you could count for, you could get in Europe. Uh, and um, Zaev meets him cordially in prison. Shortly after, uh, the policeman's cousin gives him a medical uh, bill, which you know he uses to claim and actually receive a medical leave from prison, mm-hmm. lasting a full year. The the murderer, who uh, is the SM, built their colored revolution on mm-hmm. on getting him in prison and shouting "No justice, no peace," is left uh, to stay. In uh, is left out of prison on a bogus medical, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, or, or, or medical excuse. What? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, on a bogus medical excuse for a full year, during which he plans his escape. He's supposed to return to prison, uh, like in October, and he's nowhere to be found. Apparently, some say he fled to the Netherlands. Others say he fled to Turkey. And the brother of the of the boy who was killed who was participating in each and every single protest of Vemera uh, against, against Vemera, claiming that, falsely claiming that, uh, you know, little did he know, sure. obviously, he was yeah. going after the, uh, he was manipulated by Zaev, claiming that uh, his brother was killed as part of an el- elaborate cover-up from going to the highest reaches of the Vemera government. And his brother is now interviewed, and he says, well, I'd rather not talk about this. I'm, you know, I have a family. So, so, so under Zaev, uh, now that we have justice mm-hmm. and we should have yeah. peace, the murderer flees the country and the brother of the killed boy is scared to, to even say something about this on the air. This is where we've, we've gotten, this is what it's, it's wow. come to. So nobody knows where this guy escaped to. There's rumors. Uh, some yeah. other ones. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well. They, they gave him a year to plan the escape. Yeah. He could be anywhere by now. Ah, uh, man. Well, I sure hope they find him. They bring him back, and I hope they lock him up and throw the key away. See, this is the problem. This That's is one of the problem with you. One of the problem, I, th- I think one of the problem with you Europeans, Svetin, is that you don't have the death penalty. The death mm. penalty is 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 yeah. good, and it uh, it's a deterrent. Um, uh, anyway, and and the uh, gun ownership, you know, just try sure. attack, uh, beat somebody to death. You, you have to presume he has a pistol. He has something sure, on, yeah. on, on him. So. <laughs> And uh, welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. This is Cvetan Shilimanov with Jason Miko on the line from Tucson, Arizona. And we've uh, discussed everything that is wrong with Macedonia. Now maybe <laughs> a few things that have somehow gone right. Uh, it's time for the farmers' picks. And uh, Jason, maybe you start. Yeah, sure. Um, I found this great article uh, from uh, SBS, which is the Australian uh, language service for the many languages that the Australians speak, uh, radio, TV, digital. Uh, and it's a, it's an article um, from early November here by Maggie uh, Yankoloska. Uh, and it, she says, mm-hmm. I wish I wasn't so quick to shed my native tongue. So she says, as a 10-year-old, I wanted to belong, to quickly assimilate, and to shed the dreaded title of, quote, the kid who can't speak English. So she came to Australia when she was 10 in the summer of 1998, and she quickly uh, learned the uh, the English language uh, with all of the... Uh, the rich uh, influences of the Aussie form of the English language. Uh, but she was forgetting her own Macedonian, um, and she regrets that. And this is actually a good news story because uh, she says at the end of the article, she, she has a young son, she says, having my son it feels like I'm getting it back for him, the language. Uh, she writes, he also has an innate way to draw it out of me. I comfort and sing to him in Macedonian. So it's uh, it's a nice story that it's 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 a it's a warning and a lesson to Macedonians especially those that 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 leave Macedonia and go abroad uh to to never lose that language and and to always remember it and teach it to your children and to 
to use it in, in the, culture, the rich culture of Macedonia uh, in song and poetry and literature and dance and all that. So I, I like that. It's a, it's a nice little, um, again, a little bit of a warning, but it's a, it's a good news story uh, coming out of uh, the uh, Macedonian community in Australia. So uh, that's my farmer's pick. Svetin, what is your farmer's pick? Yeah, it's also a similar Macedonian guy does a good uh, story, this time courtesy of Reuters. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, uh, I, I haven't known about this guy before. Uh, uh, Svetozar Bogdanovsky from Vilas. Mm -hmm. He is uh, uh, cited in Reuters as a maker of violins, which apparently fetch a good price, like 60,000 euros a piece. Uh, he apparently started uh, doing these wow. uh, like, uh, copies of uh, Italian masters. Uh, Stradivarius. Uh, when uh, some guy named Guarnerius oh, okay. is mentioned mm -hmm. here. <laughs> I'm not really much of an expert here. Uh, he, his son wanted to pick up the violin, and um, Svetozer built him one 35 years mm -hmm. ago, Reuters says, and since he's, he, he hasn't stopped, and he's now making them from uh, woods sourced from uh, Bosnia, from spruce and maple wood, which is, has to be dried and then soaked uh, for years before he can start working on this. There is a, a, a nice... Uh, uh, video to go with uh, uh, the process and with the report uh, which Reuters did and uh, apparently Kostadin, his son, is now uh, a notable violinist as is his uh, uh, wife who, who teaches uh, the violin and uh, since in the 35 years since uh, Svetozar Bogdanovsky has built more than 700 such instruments wow many of them copies of Italian masters. Wow, and, and, and of very, course they're highly, they're, nice yes, story. and they're highly prized by um, violin um, uh, players and collectors and orchestras around the world. Um, actually, the violin, Svetin, you, you probably don't know this, so that, that was the one instrument I, I was uh, tried to learn and did play for a while was the violin when I was a kid. So and it's just uh -huh. such a beautiful, sweet sound. Um, I actually thought about taking it up again, but... Um, I'm not sure I can afford 60,000 euros for a new violin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe start with some ch Chinese copy <laughs> at first. Well, that is great. That is a, that's a good news story coming out of uh, the town of Veles in Macedonia. Uh, so Veles isn't known only for Macedonian content farmers. <laughs> it's known for... Yeah, uh, just, just you wait. <laughs> You're having elections soon, right? Yes. <laughs> which, which reminds uh, me. <laughs> so, um, well, that's good. Two, uh, two good news stories in this podcast. Uh, Always good talking to you, Sven. Yeah, you too, buddy. Until next week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>